Um, the uh, really remarkable uh, session, as far as I'm concerned, is left for Kamran Elahian, who has been a visionary for so many of us and for iBridges. Uh, so his uh, talk is going to be the seduction of intellect compassion, uh, that brings together compassion and grace uh, to help us dream bigger. Uh, so please join us in welcoming Kamran. Well, what a day it has been. Amazing. Uh, as uh, Mahbub John asked me to come up with the title for my talk, uh, I didn't know what I was going to talk about. So I thought, uh, why don't I do something sexy, right? Seduction. <laughs> and I thought, uh, why don't uh, we just uh, mix up a number of things uh, together? and. Uh, what is actually amazing is uh, when I was listening to great speakers, uh, they gave me actually the basics of my talk today. So thanks to the existing uh, speakers. Uh, seduction of intellect, compassion, and soul. Anusha John was talking about Ray Kurzweil. Those of you who know him, you know what an amazing futurist he is. If you don't know him, just check it out. He wrote a book, his last one, or one of his last one, yeah, it's so prolific, was uh, the point of singularity is near. And in that book, and he wrote this, God, at least 10 years ago, he talked about how machine intelligence would soon surpass the human intelligence. And point of singularity being the point that human intelligence and machine intelligence come together. I thought that was a very interesting point to start my talk, but is it really all the point of singularity? Is the basics of humanity just our intelligence? Are we one dimensional intelligent species? Do we have other dimensions? Well, you can see me. So I have a physical being. Hopefully, I have a little bit of intelligence. Those two are taught and discussed a lot in the Western education. But is that all? What is our third dimension? The emotional side, the compassionate side. And what is the fourth one? The soul, the spiritual side. We are four dimensional beings. And in Western culture, they develop, help us develop our frontal cortex, which is our reasoning, our memory, our force of deduction, and put a lot of emphasis on that. And also, in Western education, physical side. We learn how to play basketball, baseball, football, whatever. Emotional side and spiritual side are not really addressed, and even sometimes poo-pooed, like, oh, what is this? Hugging the trees? You know, you love everybody? <laughs> or uh, what is this spiritual stuff? Well, life is a lot more than that. Faraj talked about successful entrepreneurs work hard, 
but he mentioned also the element of luck. How does that play into success? And Martin John talked about soul and how you have to put the soul into everything you do. I'm amazed actually at Martin. I think he has a wisdom of an 80 year old in the body of a, I don't know, 20, 30 year old or whatever. I don't know, where is he by the way? Uh, He's 21. Oh, okay. <laughs> he does have a wisdom of an 80 year old person. So let me try to give you a macro model of what I have learned. And not only I have worked really hard on uh, obviously going through schools and getting a lot of degrees, I have also worked very hard on my physical being. It might uh, not be obvious to you, but I have tried always uh, to excel in many different sports. And uh, I had uh, a lot of enthusiasm for sports. I had uh, no fear with the problem of not having much talent. Very dangerous combination. So as a result of that, as I was trying to excel in a lot of different sports, I fell down and I broke this and I broke that and I tore this ligament and that. I have had 14 surgeries in my life. Till something happened about 20 years ago or so that I started to learn a new way. I started to learn how that unusual connection that some of us or many of us get it, we don't pay attention to it, the connection to divine, the connection to some supreme force. You can get into that, tap into it, and use it for self-healing. And then you don't need to go and see so many doctors, and you don't need to have so many surgeons. And this didn't come easy. I have spent huge amount of time hiking up big mountains in my life. I have spent a lot of time in monasteries with Chinese monks, with Russian monks, Korean monks, Japanese monks. I've learned all sorts of different meditation. And I also spent quite a bit of time with shamans, the Inca shamans, some amazing thing. Two weeks with Inca shamans and later on with Toltecs in uh, Sacred Valley in Peru. One thing I really was amazed was half of the shamans, I was with eight of them. Guess what? Four of them were women. When was the last time you saw a female priest, a female rabbi, or a female mullah? It got me to think about it. What happened with Abrahamic religions? How was it that women were forgotten? Not only forgotten, they were put down within Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Why was it that everything had to be unnatural? Think about it. We have religion based on the fact that who were our parents? For many of us, we are born into a family and whatever is the religion of our parents becomes our religion. Many of the religion actually do not like it if you question things, and heavens forbid if you leave that religion. I mean, if you look at the book of Genesis, 
God created human beings, but this God who had created cats and dogs and camels and cows and lions all in pairs somehow didn't make human beings as pairs. Didn't it have enough wisdom that if you only make one of them, it might feel lonely? Just think about that. And if you have some wisdom that you believe it has to be just one, why not make Eve first and have Eve give birth to Adam? That's the natural way. Why do you have to go through this cockamamie <laughs> new way of you create Adam first and Adam feels lonely and you take this super unnatural nonsense way of from the seventh rib create that? Why not just do it the natural way? Why do you have to go against nature to create a religion? When you spend time with some pagan religions, you think about it, and actually they believe in many gods. And they use their brains based on cause and effect to decide off of a few tens of gods, hundreds of gods, millions of gods, Deity, they select which one of them gives them what they want. And they believe in that God. So if you are a fisherman and you are trying to go fishing, you pray to gods of ocean and say, hey, I'm going fishing. Please take care of me. If it did, you say, this God favors me. I pray to it and give it some offering. If on the other token, that God did not favor you, next day you pray to God of Sun and say, hey, God of Sun, please come and help me. And if it didn't work, the day after that you pray to God of Wind and Storm and say, don't come. <laughs> Give it offering. Sooner or later you find a God that favors you is cause and effect. I'm not a pagan, I'm just talking about different ways. Try to get you to think outside of whatever you might have been taught. Now imagine if you were a pagan and somebody invaded your con country through some force which happened in the history repeatedly, and you were told that you are not allowed to have this cause and effect, very scientific method of selecting your God. And you have to believe in the God that I push you to believe in. And it's God Almighty. And you say, oh, okay, interesting. Can I read your book? And you read the first paragraph of the book of Genesis and says what? God created us, heavens and earth, in six days. God Almighty. And then what did he do? God had gender. What did he do? He rested. You say, this God Almighty that's the most powerful than anyone is not as powerful as me, as powerful as any of you. I have worked sometimes weeks, months without a day of rest. That's the work of an entrepreneur. And I have to believe in a God that just got tired after six days. And then this God 
creates the tree of knowledge, but says you should not partake in that. Now, Adam was a lazy bum and didn't have any curiosity, but Eve was smart, wanted to learn, and goes and tries to partake in tree of knowledge. And you punish her for that? To use the brain that you, the God, gave it to her? Just think about the logic and see how some of these things have been ingrained in our brains. And we are not supposed to think about it. We are not supposed to use a key dimension of our humanity. We should just be the sheep and follow whatever was the religion of our parents. And the story even gets worse. God gets angry with Eve, puts all the blame on Eve, and punishes Eve the mafia style. You know how mafia punishes you? They kill you, kill your child, your grandchild, your great-grandchild. This God says, Eve, because you disobeyed me, you will suffer at the time of labor, and your daughter would suffer, and your granddaughter, and her granddaughter. And guess what? Anytime as I travel around the world, and I meet people, they ask me, what is your nationality? I say, I'm a human being. I'm a global citizen. And then they ask me, what's your religion? I say, I respect all of religion, as long as they don't push me to accept and live by their rules. I like to experiment and learn about many different religions. What's wrong with that? Why should we be punished or killed? Because we are diverging from the religion of our parents. And the answer many times we are given when you talk to anybody who has a strong belief that the only way to get to God is through their religion, I ask them, how many people are the believers in your religion? The answer is 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, a billion. No religion has more than a billion, billion and a half. And I ask them a second question. Did your God create all of humanity? And they say, yes. I said, so your God created eight billion people, and only one and a half billion of them max are good? That's a very, very high failure rate. If your God was my VP of manufacturing, I would fire his ass at no time. Now, why do I bring this up? It hurts me when I see people in the name of religion are attacked, people trying to control half of our humanity. Females try to control them, put them down. I live in America. Every time I listen, all of these things that governments try to control, the rights of women not to have control over their bodies. How does that make sense? Why is that government's job? Why is that a religious person's thing? To interfere. Now, when we come back to the four dimensions of humanity, we start to think a little bit differently. 
our intellectual side tries to go use synthetic tools to make our mythology become real. What are some of the things that we have had in mythology? Almost every culture you study has this, some sort of animal combination of bird, big bird, call it dragon, call it seymour, whatever, that flies and can carry people around. You can ride it, huge bird, and has special powers. So we use our intellect, and guess what? We made airplanes, helicopters. We made that magical mythology of dragon, of Seymour, become reality. You look at every mythology. We have had discussions about these people, the witches, if you study Hamlet, the witches brew. You look into that and you see what is happening in another part of the world. Well, it's a webcam connected to 4G or 5G telling you what is happening in London or what's happening in Paris as we are sitting in here. We used our human intelligence to go and develop synthetic technology that make mythology become reality. So every culture that I study believes on some sort of a supreme being. Within Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the mythology of God is almighty, powerful, that knows everything, knows what you have done, and knows what you are doing, and knows what you are going to do in the future. Now, as we look at internet, as we look at Web 2.0, Web 3.0, as we see the cameras all over, machine intelligence getting to the point that keeps track of not just one of us, but all of us, which websites we have gone to, what books we have read, what purchases we have done, guess what? Synthetically, we are creating that definition of mythology of God. In a real way, you know, Voltaire has a very interesting saying. Voltaire says, if God created us in his image, we did a hell of a job reciprocating it. <laughs> Meaning, we went and created this God that was an old man in the sky that controlled everything, controlled the youth and controlled the women. Now, is that really the definition of God that we want to have? And where is the point of singularity where synthetically we are creating machine intelligence which is superior to human intelligence. So is that going to be our new God? Is point of singularity the merging of human intelligence and machine intelligence? As Ray Kurzweil says, think about it. There is this other thing called emotions. 
compassion. So we have created actually a cloud that keeps track of our emotions also. Facebook knows. Every time you say, I like this, I don't like that. I hate this, I love that. So it's trying to keep track of our emotions. It doesn't have all of our senses. Definitely, you look at the internet with all of the metadata. It has the text. It has the audio. It has, through the webcams, the audio, the video. Soon, we are having sensors which have the sense of smell, 10,000 times higher than nose of a dog. So all the smells of the world will be captured. So is that where we are going? We are creating our own supreme power. Mythology reincarnated. What is missing there? Is there already an organic cloud? When Mozart, at the age of five, wrote some symphonies, did he sit around and study music? Did he try to spend 10 weeks, 10 months writing that symphony? Hell no. Five-year-old kid gets a download. When the prophets got the downloads, they started to give us some ideas, advice, beyond what we knew. That's called spirituality. It's called having access, connection, Elham, Bah, for those of you who speak Farsi, from God, a divine intervention. Is that something that's possible? I bet you. Many of you, if you go back from your childhood, Anushe is not the only one who from childhood had a dream to be an astronaut. Every one of you, every one of you, if you go back and think about it, had a mission in life. The problem is, we are told that's your dream. Quit dreaming, become real, and forget about the impossible things. Some of us agree and forget about it. Some of us pursue it because somehow when you go back, we have touched that divine intervention. That knowledge has come to us. Now, we don't have very good understanding of it. We call it this our gut feel. You say, it's my intuition that tells me what I should do. Or as Martin says, you follow your soul's view. That's when life becomes really interesting, because you don't give up so easily. That is your life mission. You have to pursue it. When I was eight, nine years old, I went and I asked my mom a very simple question. I said, Mom, my mom and my dad were Baha'is, and they believed 
that to be a good Baha'i, you have to believe in all other religions. So I asked my mom, how could you believe in all these religions? Because they're all fighting and killing each other. She said, son, I cannot describe to you the concept of God, but I can give you an example. If God was like a son, Moses comes from one side, picks up some shiny reflective material, and clears up and shows you the reflection of the sun. And it says for you to see it, you have to bend it four degrees this way or five degrees this way. Jesus comes from this side and says, no, let me show you how you wipe this clean, get the reflection, but you have to turn it 32 degrees and 68 degrees. And Muhammad comes from this side, and Buddha comes from this side, and 800 or so African religions, 800 or so African religions come each from different sides. And my mom said, the problem is we start to worship that piece of glass, reflective thing, or that piece of metal that has been polished. And we forget about God. And we fight each other because we say that's the only way to see divine. So I thought, well, that was interesting. And what was also interesting about her religion, when I turned 16, it was my duty to go and search for truth. So she encouraged me to go and study other religions. And her prophet said, when you study a religion, you decide what you want to have. And I decided I didn't want to be a Baha'i. I decided not to have a religion. And she was not allowed to kill me, and she was not allowed to complain because God gave me a brain, I had a chance to go and study on my own. So, how can we get that spiritual connection to work? Again, in part of today's talk, Faraj talked about paid forward. Buddha calls it the acts of compassion. Martin also talked about it, help other people without expecting anything. So I have a simple recipe for you. Create a list of all the people that you have done bad things to them, whenever it was, if you believe you did them wrong, contact them and ask for their forgiveness. That's step one. Step two, go and create a list of all the people who did wrong to you, who did bad things to you that you are still pissed off at them. Contact them and say, I'm not angry with you anymore, and I'm forgiving you. A very special mentor and friend, Dalai Lama, when he was tortured, imprisoned by Chinese government. When he was released, he went and hugged all these prison guards. And those people said, are you crazy? He says, I forgive you. 
said, why do you do this? He said, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for myself. If I hate you, this is garbage. And I don't want to be a garbage truck carrying all of this with me all the time. So for my sake, I'm forgiving all of you. And it's a lot easier. Life becomes so much easier when you forgive. Stop hating whoever did wrong to you. Anybody can come and harm me once, but not twice. I don't take revenge on them. I just put my energy in building friendship and relationship with other people. But I don't carry negative feelings about them. I forgive and forget very quickly. But there is a third step. This one is the most difficult one. If you learn how to forgive yourself. Guess what? Many of us, if we have been raised within Abrahamic religions, we are somehow, somehow, guilty without having had a chance to do much bad. And we feel bad about ourselves. You're OK. Forgive yourself. You do these three things, sooner or later, you will see that you start to get a lot of understandings of how the world is going. And you spend your time and energy in completely different things. Now, Faraj talked about being lucky. Luck has nothing to do with it. I'll tell you the secret. It feels lucky, but there are two forces in our universe. Now, again, this is mythology we have had from the days of Zoroastria, Zardosh, who talked about Ahura Mazda and Ahriman. Hindus talk about Krishna and Shiva. Christians talk about Christ and Antichrist. Muslims talk about Allah and Satan. George Lucas talks about Star Wars. May the force be with you, force of Jedi or the force of Darth Vader, the force of bad. But our technology, is, our knowledge, has started to demystify the mythology. We have now understanding of first point of singularity. When Big Bang happened, the force of Big Bang continues creating, evolving more and more and more. But what is interesting is as human beings, our sensors can only see 5% of universe. 95% of universe, we call it combination of dark matter and dark energy. Dr. Lisa Randall says there is nothing dark about it. It's translucent, does not reflect light. Therefore, we don't see it. And that force is around us. Only recently, last month, we were able to take pictures of black hole, the force of black hole. 
that is gobbling everything up, destroying everything. So we have the force of good, creation, evolution, and the force of bad, destruction, side by side around us. And every day, if you go and pay it forward, help other people, you align yourself with the force of good. And as Star Wars says, may the force be with you, good things happen, and it accelerates you. Unfortunately, the same thing works on the bad side. You align yourself with the force of bad, and it helps you and accelerates that in destruction of the world. You look at Hitler, you look at Stalin. They got a lot of acceleration, a lot of force of bad allowed them to move forward. The choice is in our hands. And as an entrepreneur, if you understand the four dimensions around you, your physical dimension, your intellectual dimension, your emotional, compassionate side. If you know all of these, the spiritual side opens up for you. And intuitively, you will know you are on the right track. You don't give up easily. And the force will be with you. Love you all. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kamal John. What an incredible way to end this remarkable day. The message of healing by forgiving, moving forward, centering ourselves, that humanity is still evolving, that as human beings, our sensors are going to only see 5% of the universe. So we have to cleanse ourselves. We have to be free to be able to go into this future to be able to find our spiritual center, to be able to be present, and to be able to give and work harder. And as we end our event today, there will be more networking right after this. Um, our hearts are full. Our hearts are full of light. And um, in this tapestry that is being woven with Tirgon, we still have so much that we're going to be experiencing in the next couple days. Uh, so please take it all in, enjoy it. Uh, Ibridges is just beginning its legacy. Uh, its stories are still unfolding in the work that all of you are doing. So thank you so much, and we'll see you next year.